Hey, did you hear about the weird massive snowstorms out on the West Coast? Here we've got like Forsythia in February. They've got spring snow. Out in California uh, last week, it snowed eight feet in some places. The snow was literally up to the roof lines. It's just crazy, just crazy. I don't know what's going on, but I remember the big snows as a kid. Anybody remember the excitement of that big snow when you're a kid? Like there's two feet, three feet. School's canceled for a week. Man, what do we want to do? We just want to get out there, right? Get out and play in the snow. Did you like to build a snowman uh, sled ride? Maybe build like an igloo-type snow fort or something? Have a snowball fight? Alex, we could throw some snowballs, man. I know you've got a good arm. I just wanted to get out there, just like you. Like, I want to get out in the snow, Mom. I'm up. Okay, I have breakfast. Can I get out there already? Can I get out there? No. You've got some business to take care of first. We have some rules. Before you can go out and play in the snow, you have to get your long johns on, your thermal undershirt, uh, your wool socks, number four, turtleneck sweater, number five, ski pants, number six, heavy winter ski jacket with a hood up, number seven, the toboggan cap, number eight, boots, Number nine, the scarf. Number 10, the waterproof gloves. Ten rules before I could even step out there to go play and enjoy the snow. Ten rules I had to follow. Come on, Mom. Mom, are you watching? Today? Come on, Mom. I just want to get outside. The snow is melting. Kind of looked a little bit like this guy here. Anybody know his name? I wanted to call him Little Ralphie, but that's actually Little Ralphie's brother, uh, Randy. So I'm going to mess up and call this fellow Little Ralphie later. I, I apologize in advance because I know that's going to happen. But uh, I was like this kid. I could hardly move my arms. That's how bundled up I was. What kind of parent would do that to a child? What kind of parent would enforce those kind of rules? That's a bit much, isn't it? Perhaps it's a bit much. But that overbundled kid, Randy, is going to be able to stay out there in the snow do all the things we talked about, going to be able to survive and last out there for more than just a few minutes. And he's not going to catch his death and pneumonia. That's what my mom used to say to me. Don't go out there and catch your death and pneumonia. So shift gears with me for a minute. Imagine the other sort of parent. They, let their, they see their kid. He comes down in, in shorts, a T-shirt, no coat, maybe flip-flops. Go on out. Go for it, man. Have fun. That kid's going to be back inside within five to ten minutes, freezing cold, wet, uh, miserable, and they're not going to get to enjoy all the activities that Randy is going to get to enjoy because they're not protected. I don't want to judge which parent's the more loving of the two parents, but the one that bundles up their kid would appear to be more caring, maybe offering more better protection. Now, I know rules can be annoying and hard to handle, for sure. I'm like the king of not liking rules. But they serve a purpose. And often the purpose of a rule or a set of rules, like my 10 garments I had to wear, has a purpose. And the purpose is often to protect us. I don't enjoy having a ton of rules placed on me. It really freaks me out. It makes me feel anxious. Um, I, get, I feel disrespected when someone's pounding me with rule after rule. And so I was at Kroger yesterday the U scan, placing my scan of my item, doing, following the rules. Before I could put it in the bag, please place the item in the bagging area before scanning the next item. I do it, and before I can put the next, please place the item in the bagging area before scanning the next item. And I'm I, I like felt anger. I felt anger. I'm like, stop, man, you're pounding me here. Slow down. I'm doing my best. Also, I mean, I'm just a habitual rule breaker. My wife, Lisa, who many of you know, will be shaking her head right now and laughing, going, yeah, he is. Uh, I don't like instruction manuals. I don't like to look at maps. I'm just that intuitive, free-form kind of dude. And I like to live that way, but it gets me in trouble sometimes. I think some of you can relate. I see some heads nodding out there. Hey, so today we're going to be continuing in our relevant series, um, reading through the Bible in a year, Ancient Words, Relevant Truth. And today, uh, Matt Santon, our lead pastor, asked me to lead us through a quick study of the Ten Commandments. So we're going to be in the book of Exodus today. He asked me to develop a message around this scripture from the Old Testament. I think on the one hand, it was a bit of an ironic choice by Matt, knowing my relationship with rules. But on the other hand, I think he might have known exactly what he was doing. And oh, by the way, 
if you think Matt is unwise, I'm up here, and I've been working on a sermon all week, and Matt's in the Caribbean on a luxury cruise ship with his wife Stacy, cruising the Caribbean islands. Which one of the two of us is the wiser? I'll let you decide. I'll let you decide. Let me pray for us real quick, and we're going to jump into this scripture and see what we can learn. Father God, as we look into the book of Exodus, into your ancient words, and your book of truth, into your word, Lord, refresh what we think, feel, believe, and remember about the Ten Commandments. Open our hearts, Lord. Help us to refresh our position, however we feel about the Ten Commandments. There's something, you have something new for us today, Lord. Just open us up and give us that discernment to see what that is, what you have for us today. Amen. You've already seen one set of rules, my go play in the snow rules from a kid. We're going to be looking at a really famous set of rules, way more famous than that today. We're going to be looking at the Ten Commandments to see what we can learn from them. I will mess up the word commandments a million times, so we're calling it the Big Ten. That's the sermon title for today, and it's called the Big Ten. You thought it was all about Selection Sunday, didn't you, in March Madness? Uh, it's not. It's about the Ten Commandments. Just to save time and make it a little easier for me to pronounce, we're going to call it the Big Ten for short. We'll be primarily in Exodus uh, chapter 20. That's the second book in your Bible. I invite you to follow along. If you can't, uh, it'll be up on the screen and we'll, uh, we'll figure it out together. So let me take you quickly through the story of the Big Ten. God told his people to assemble near the base of Mount Sinai. He told them to purify themselves because they would be standing near God. They were going to be on holy ground. You need to purify yourself for three days. He told them to listen for a long blast from a trumpet coming from the mountain. All of this he spoke to them through Moses. Next, he proceeded to make the mountain shake and rumble and smoke to pour out of it and the mountain to actually start spewing fire. Then God descended down. They could see. Remember, they've, they've already followed him through getting out of Egypt. They know what God's presence looks like. He descends onto the top of Mount Sinai. The Israelites hear the trumpet blast. Then God spoke to them directly in his booming, loud voice, spoke to them the Ten Commandments. My parents had one of these in the hallway of our house growing up about the time that I was Randy's size. And I would look at this in the hallway and stare at this odd language with the thou shalt nots. And the graven image, I thought maybe this was a graven, I don't know, I was confused. Uh, coveting, I, what's that all about? Sabbath keeping, I don't know. I mean, I just look, these words are archaic to me. Um, and they're still just a little bit awkward, honestly. These are the Ten Commandments. And guess what? We're not going to go line by line. If you were like kind of dreading coming in here today, oh my gosh, Skip's going to go through we're going to understand how not to covet. That's not what we're doing. This is pretty much the only time we're going to look at this whole set of ten. We're going to look all around it, because I think that's where the treasure is, all around the ten, not going line by line parsing the ten. You all know these. You've all seen them. Unless you live under a rock, you've seen the Ten Commandments. So God speaks these to the Israelites in his booming, frightening voice. The Israelites take it all in. They are terrified, and they tremble with the fear of God, literally. They promised to obey God's commandments. I would too. I mean, seen that and heard that. Uh, they, they said, we'll obey God. And they pleaded to Moses to deal with them for God so that they never had to hear or see him directly ever again. This is in Exodus uh, 20, verse eight, beginning in verse 18. And it says, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. What kind of God would do this? What kind of God would do this? Drop powerfully, forcefully, frighteningly, drop a tenfold, highly restrictive set of rules on his people. Literally strike the fear of God into them. And oh, by the way, there were more than just ten. God gave them hundreds more. You can find those in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Later, the Jewish religious leaders, the authorities of the Jewish church, added hundreds more. By the time Jesus hit the ground, centuries later, by the time Jesus arrived, there were 613 rules in total that they all had to live by, and the Jewish church 
The Jewish church called those the law. As you're sitting there today staring at the Big Ten, let me check in with you this morning. Just the question is this, what do we do with the Big Ten? What do we do with this set of rules? What do we do with it today? Some of you really dislike the Ten Commandments. It seems old and outdated. We've already gotten a little feel for that, I think. Do we just put it aside such antiquated and irrelevant things as animal sacrifice and smoting? Do we put it aside? Do we dismiss the Big Ten? Others are confused by the Big Ten. How does it fit with the new covenant that Jesus brought to us? I've heard what Jesus, I've read it. It seems like Jesus made this obsolete with what he said later. Didn't Jesus render the Big Ten obsolete? And so, if that's true, do we disregard the Big Ten? Do we dismiss it? Do we disregard it? One more possibility, still others, you stare at the Big Ten, and instantly you feel burdened and ashamed. How will I ever keep up with these? I've already broken all, all or most of them, and I do it again and again. How will I ever comply with this set of rules? Does the Big Ten exist to make me feel guilty? If so, I really dislike it. Do we dismiss it? Do we dislike it? Do we disregard it? We're going to figure that out. Come along with me. I've asked all of these same questions in different points of my life. In my walk with the Lord, in my study of the Bible, I have felt all three of those, sometimes all at once, honestly. We're going to figure that out. We're going to sort it out. The Big Ten doesn't have to be a stumbling block for you or me. It doesn't have to be. We're going to make sense of it. Will you come along with me for the next 20 minutes? There's something new for you, I promise. There's something new, something to encourage you, and something to give you hope. But we study the Big Ten. Here's the tension. We study it, and it feels burdensome. It feels antiquated, like too many layers of winter clothing. It's restrictive. And so it begs the question, is the Big Ten even still relevant today? That's what we're going to dig into. Let me give you the bottom line right up front, because I know, where is he going with this? You're a little curious. The bottom line right up front, the Big Ten doesn't punish, it protects. The Big Ten doesn't punish us, it protects us. That one's not on your fill-in-the-blanks page in your notes, but I encourage you to jot that down because that's kind of the takeaway where we're going to land. I invite you to look a little closer now at the story of the Big Ten as we return to Exodus. It's helpful to gather a bit of context, setting, scene, and cast, to be precise. We're going to get that context, so let's first look at the cast there's God. One of the people in this story is God, Yahweh, father of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, God, creator of heaven and earth. That's a main player in this story. Moses, another player. Another part of the cast is Moses. He, working on behalf of God, led the people out of Egypt. He sees God face to face. God speaks through him and to him. Moses is a prophet. He's also a scribe, a historian, a mountain climber, a leader, and a songwriter. The Israelites, third part of the cast, players in this story, the Israelites, they're newly freed slaves. We sang about it. They were delivered out of Egypt, but they had no Bible, no Jesus, and they're not professional campers. Uh, We see throughout the Old Testament they grumble a lot. And uh, they're kind of pretty tired at this point. Let's get into the setting. That brings us to the setting. So where are we? What's going on? We're in the desert region of the Sinai Peninsula. It's today part of modern-day Egypt, but at that time they had just fled. It's across the border from Egypt. They're about 220 miles directly south of Jerusalem. That's about the distance from here to Cleveland for comparison. If they look behind them to the south, they see Mount Sinai standing, rising about one and a half times as tall as our Spruce Knob here in West Virginia, a tall mountain. This arid, mountainous land is not very desirable. It's hot, hilly, not a lot of water here. Only about 600,000 people live there today. The Israelites have just freed, they've just fled from Egypt. They're free from 400 years of captivity and slavery under Pharaoh. Think think in terms of hard labor, making bricks, moving heavy stuff in the hot heat, uh, in the sand, in a culture immersed with many gods. In that culture in Egypt, there were idols and gods everywhere, and even some humans like Pharaoh were considered gods. So they were in a multi-theistic culture. 
our God didn't like that. You hear about that a lot. Uh, they must be feeling tired and weary. Hey, God, thank you for getting us out of Egypt. That was awful, but now look where we are. We're in a desert, no food, no water. What are we doing here? To have to be frustrated, confused, maybe a little bit weary, a little bit skeptical. I would be. After miraculously crossing the Red Sea, they've trekked 60 days to get to this point where we find them and pick up the story. I said it's hot and dry, and the Israelites are no small tribe, not by any means. Until I studied this, I thought maybe like 150 people. It's way more than that. There's, there's debate about the actual number of the people, but it's a lot more than 150. So they have a lot of mouths to feed, a lot of people to find water for. And how many of you are leaders or managers or organizers? Have you ever tried to get a big group to get organized, focused, and move in, in, a, in a direction? It ain't easy, is it? It's really hard. I want to take you back to the very first verse in our chapter where, again, we're in Exodus 20. Let's look at verses 1 and 2, because I think it's revealing. And Aaron will put that up on screen for us. It says in, in Exodus 20, beginning in verse 1, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And if we were to hop back to Exodus 3, we could see a similar, a similar tone from, from God the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So the Big Ten shows us God's heart, doesn't it? This chapter of Exodus begins to show us God's heart, and that's on your fill-in-the-blank notes page. If you picked one of those up, that's number four. Go ahead and fill that in. So we get our first glimpse of God's heart. He loved them enough to rescue them, bring them out of Egypt. Plus, God had a plan for the Israelites. They didn't know what he had in store. Crystal talked about that when she was up here earlier. We often don't know what's coming. But he didn't just pluck them out of slavery in Egypt to drop them in the desert to suffer. He had a plan to give them the best land around, around the land of milk and honey. It was called Canaan, and it's about 220 miles north. They just had to get there. They had to get there. And that was going to be way, way better than where they were in the Sinai Desert. So in much the same way, Little Randy needed protection to be able to go out and play in the snow. The Israelites needed protection to make that desert journey 220 miles north to get to the promised land. It wasn't going to be easy. It was going to be very challenging. They needed a guide for that journey, and God gave them a survival guide. We call it the Big Ten. It would help them live and function and survive as they made their way north to, to Canaan. Now, as, when they were slaves in Egypt... They had masters who told them what to do, when to get up, when to work, when to take a break, when to eat, when to go to the bathroom. They don't have that anymore, so they needed guidance. They no longer had someone, they had freedom, no longer someone telling them what to do every minute of the day. God gave the Big Ten to the Israelites to protect them, and that's another blank you can fill in on your sheet. Number three, in fact. If you dislike the Big Ten, if, when you answer one of those three questions... If your heart was like, yeah, I dislike this a lot, maybe you begin to feel that there's something here, that God had something for the Israelites, and that shifts your opinion a little bit, maybe. Let me try to move your opinion meter uh, just a little more with another basic fact. The Big Ten is a conditional covenant. It's a set of rules or an oath. Any attorneys in the room, Hurley, he, Hoover, I'm treading way out of my lane here, talking about a conditional covenant, so you real, hold me accountable and, and keep me uh, correct here. But in the legal definition, an oath is a contract or an agreement with language that sets forth conditions and outcomes. Conditions and outcomes. Essentially, it contains a specified set of rules, and it promises a set of rewards if those rules are followed. Well, we've looked at the rules, haven't we? And we all know them. That's the Big Ten. Thou shalt, thou shalt, don't covet. You know, we, we know that. Let's look at the rewards. Let's zoom in on the rewards that came with this covenant. Here's what God promised the Israelites. I will be your God. You will be my treasured possession. I will pour out my favor upon you. You will be set apart. A shining example to all the other nations. I will give you their lands, a land of milk and honey. And that sounds pretty good to me. Most favored nation status, good land. I've got a God now. Um, I'm God's treasured possession, and we still are today. Don't just take my word for it about those rewards. Don't take my word for it. It's too important. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19. We're going to back up one chapter, and beginning in verse 5, verses 5 and 6, it says this. 
Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you were to speak to the Israelites. I'll tell you, in my Bible reading and study over the years, I have tended to focus way too heavily on the rules, and I never gave enough credence, enough weight to the rewards. These God-breathed rewards are found throughout all five of the first five books of the Bible. They're right there. So when we consider the rewards attached to the rules, there's more to like, perhaps less to dislike about the Big Ten. From the rewards perspective, we get an expanded view of God's heart. And we get another glimpse at his love for his people. I want to pivot here. We've been talking to the dislikers. I want to talk to the disregarders for a minute. So you're like, I don't care if I like it or dislike it. I just, logically, I want to disregard it because I don't think it's relevant anymore. I don't like the language and didn't Jesus make it irrelevant. So when I sat down to prepare this message, I wrestled with this. I honestly did. And I was prepared to stand up here today and recommend to you all that we disregard the Big Ten because of Jesus. I was ready to do that, all in on that. And I I looked further, and I realized that I had some gaps in that thinking. And so I wanted to get clarity on this. I was ready to disregard because, for me, it's an impossible set of 613 rules. I can't follow one rule, much less 613. It's inconveniently impossible to stop and make atonement for my sin every single time I sin. Impossible. Hey, Will, got a dove? I sinned again. Oh, crap, I sinned again. Hey, Lisa, do you have a ram? We're going to need to make a burnt offering tonight. Uh, We're going to need to burn a ram because I sinned again. Third, it's not a pathway to salvation. If you follow the Big Ten, it's not a pathway to heaven. It's really not. That's also in the Scripture. That's a whole other topic. And also because I thought it was made obsolete by Jesus' teachings. Even more than that, I wanted to jump past the Big Ten because of Jesus' new covenant. We're going to talk about that. Let's look at a couple verses from the Gospel part of the Bible. And this is the basis for my thoughts and my preliminary position coming into this message today. is We're going to go look in Matthew 22, beginning in verse 35. And we'll, put, we'll have it up on screen for you. It says this, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him, Jesus, with the question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. So here we find Jesus framing up the greatest commandment. Was he dissing the Big Ten with this? Was he holding up this up and, and making it above the Big Ten? Is it Jesus' two-part greatest commandment or, or Moses' Big Ten? At this point, I'm still pretty unsure. I'm still uncertain. So I, I did try to get some clarity on this issue. I sat down and studied it, and I did what's shown on the screen here. I did a matching exercise. On the one page, I, took, I wrote the Big Ten, the Old, the old Covenant, the, the Great Commandments, the, great, the Ten Commandments. I told you I'd mess that up. I'm sticking with the Big Ten. Over here, Jesus' Greatest Commandment, Parts 1A and 1B. And then I said, how do they line up? Are they similar? Is there any, any match? And what you find is that the, the first four align with Jesus' Greatest Commandment, Part 1A, Love God. And the second six match to part 1b, love your neighbor, love people. So they align beautifully. It's a great exercise to do. I encourage you to do it. It's really rich and rewarding to to do that. And if there's any school teachers in the room, you know we love a good matching worksheet, right? We love a good matching exercise. So we're getting there. We're beginning to answer some of these questions as we wrestle through this. Let's dig a little deeper. Looking further, if Jesus had intended to disregard or perhaps dismiss the Big Ten, why would he have featured it in his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount? If he, if he wanted to get rid of it, would he have featured it as part of that message? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. And so let's look at one verse there as proof, because he did, Jesus did speak about the Ten Commandments in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. This is the NIV version. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
Boy, that's enlightening, isn't it? That changed my position. That pretty much clinched it for me. When I saw that, I was like, Jesus was not teaching me to look away from the Big Ten. On the contrary, per his direct quote right there, he was supporting it, building upon it, and he said, I'm here to fulfill it. So Jesus didn't dismiss the Big Ten. He fulfilled it, and that's on your worksheet. Another one. Number five, Jesus didn't dismiss the Big Ten. He fulfilled it. If you still need a little more evidence, maybe a little more convincing, here are a couple more very solid, important evidence from the Bible that we cannot disregard and just set, set aside or dismiss the Big Ten. Number one, these commandments, the Big Ten, are found not only in Exodus, but also in Leviticus and Deuteronomy throughout the Old Testament. Nine of the Big Ten from the Old Testament appear in the New Testament. Nine of the ten. And the Big Ten is Scripture. And here's what we know about Scripture, that all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That's from 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. Basically says all Scripture is holy. We can't throw any of it away. Everything in this book is God-breathed and valuable, and it's holy, and it's enduring, and we can learn from it. It's profitable. It's valuable to us. Let's step outside of the Bible for a minute. I found a very helpful quote from an English theologian named N.T. Wright. And this is from his 1991 book titled, The Climax of the Covenant. I just love how he frames this up for us. It says, The Torah, the law of Moses at Sinai, is given for a specified period of time and then is set aside not because it was a bad thing and now happily abolished, but because it was a good thing whose purpose had now been accomplished. At the end of the analysis, here's what we find from a number of sources. The New Testament is relevant, the Old Testament is relevant, and therefore the Big Ten is still relevant today. And that's one you can fill in on your blank. So it's not an either-or proposition. It's not old or new. It's not Moses or Jesus. Who are you voting for? It's both. It's both. So knowing these things, we'd be unwise to dismiss, disregard, or dislike the Big Ten. We need to view it in the proper context. We just need to view it in the proper context. We need to step out of the 1 through 10 and look at it in its full truth. The context of the Israelites, their circumstances, in the context of the rewards and Jesus' later teachings. So we need to view the Big Ten in the proper context. That's also a fill in the blank for you. Number two. The next slide you're going to see up on screen here is a metaphor. Um, it's a metaphor for transformation. And Aaron, you can go ahead and put that up. The butterfly and the caterpillar. We all have learned about it in grade school. We all know this process. It's mysterious. It's mind-blowing that that caterpillar on the left goes into a chrysalis, something that looks like a dried-up ball of leaves or a small bee's nest, and out comes the same creature fully transformed as a butterfly. It's mind-blowing. Only God could do something like that. It's pure transformation. You saw that God gave the Big Ten to the Israelites. They needed it. It was an operating system for them to live and make that journey we talked about through the desert. They had the Caterpillar operating system, the Caterpillar OS. It was slow and primitive, but it allowed them to move forward. And they were protected. It was valuable. God gave us Jesus Christ. He brought us a whole new way to live, a whole new covenant. Like the Israelites in Egypt, we were slaves, slaves to sin. No matter how hard we tried, how hard we still try, how hard I try, I can't break free of sin on my own. I just can't do it, no matter my best intentions or how hard I try. God knew that. God knew that's how it was going to be for us. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, as our forever sacrifice. No more lambs and rams and doves and pigeons. When Jesus died on the cross, he was the permanent atonement for our sins, our permanent sacrifice. When we accept a personal relationship with Jesus, we get a Redeemer. Our sins are forever forgiven, forever. And no longer are we trapped by rules or chained in shame because of when we've broken those rules. That's called sins. And this covenant Jesus brought us is a covenant of grace. Grace. We get what we didn't deserve. It's like the butterfly emerging from the chrysalis. It's purely a transformation purely a transformation. God didn't get rid of the caterpillar and kill them all off and replace them with butterfly. He lets that transition happen. 
That transformation goes from caterpillar to butterfly. God let the transformation happen from Big Ten to the covenant of grace that Jesus brought us with, with the great commandment and his teaching. Do you want to live under the law of the caterpillar? Or do you want to live under the covenant of grace? I like butterflies way more than caterpillars. But I realize I can't have the beautiful butterfly, the majestic monarch, without the creepy crawly caterpillar. Paul framed it up. I think Paul punctuates this and, and finalizes it for us. And we look in Romans 6, verse 14. Romans 6, verse 14. I want to I read it from the Bible. Hear me on this, if you hear nothing else. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. Who brought us that grace? Jesus Christ. It's available to every one of us that believe in him. Wow. What kind of God would do this? What kind of God would do this? What kind of parent, what kind of father would do this? A very loving one. A very powerful and loving one would do this for us. The last fill in the blank. We can live in the freedom Jesus gave us when he brought the new covenant of grace. That's number six. I want to sum it all up and get you out of here so you can go take a nap. <laughs> Change the clock stays rough. I know how you're feeling. Uh, as, you, as you bear with me for one more minute, I want you to think about the seatbelt in your car. Just take a second, close your eyes, see it. Okay, most Americans today, we wear a seatbelt willingly without much thought. It's automatic. We reach, we click, and we go. It's a rule. We are required by law to wear a seatbelt whenever we travel in a car. Not just us, but our passengers. It's also not just a rule, but it's protection for our good. The reward of that protection is that we have a much better chance of surviving if we're in a car crash when we wear that seatbelt, that protection. The winter coat and the 10 layers of clothing for little Randy, it was a rule, but the reward allowed him to remain out in the cold and enjoy playing in the snow. The rules protected him. Your seatbelt protects you. What if every time we click our seatbelt this week, we reframe the rules, and we thank God for his protection. Every time we click our seatbelt, we remember, this, this week, I'm going to do it. I invite you to do it with me. Every time you click it, remember how much God loves us and protects us. And just say a, thick, a quick, thank you, Jesus, when you click that seatbelt in. Remember this if you remember nothing else. We're going to go back to the bottom line up front. The Big Ten doesn't punish us. It protects us. Let me pray for us. And we'll, we'll head out of here. We're going to fly out of here like butterflies today. Let me pray you out. Father God, you free the Israelites. And you free us through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving us a savior and a redeemer in Jesus. Thank you for the Big Ten and all the wisdom and instruction. You give us through your word, both the Old Testament and the New. Thank you for snow days. Thank you for butterflies, caterpillars, and seatbelts. We praise you for the wonder of your creation in the mighty, majestic name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and King. We pray, amen and amen.